I've always been really curious about the world, how it works, how things function, and science has always provided me with the reasons and the explanations behind it. I remember a science lesson very vividly watching Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth and sitting there watching it and being amazed at how much evidence there was for climate change and yet there's just no global call to action. One of the biggest problems we are facing in the human race right now is the climate catastrophe that is pending. So that's what drives me and allows me to really be dedicated to this field. If we're ever to actually achieve net zero, then we need innovative solutions to both convert or capture, use gases like carbon dioxide and create sustainable materials from that. But this is such a difficult process, right? You've got to break the carbon-oxygen bond, which is thermodynamically very stable. And then we told Dan, we've got to design something, design a new, completely new system, which will not only capture the carbon dioxide, but then interact with other molecules within the system and make value-added products. I started researching novel materials in order to carry out transformations with carbon dioxide to be able to utilize carbon dioxide as a feedstock because there are no scalable solutions currently to be able to do that. We're carrying out reactions just as normal, we were trying different materials and I put it all into the reactor, ran the reaction and then a few hours later we tried to remove the reactor and there was just this horrible goopy mess. That was the proof that the technology we had put in and designed to transform carbon dioxide had worked. The material we had made was derived from carbon dioxide and it was there we realised we had something of real importance. Till then we'd never uh, found a way to activate carbon dioxide. So he was one of the first in the lab to find that methodology to do it. Which is where we thought there's real value in a startup. There are no real big scalable solutions yet and it makes you begin to wonder why that is and Robert and I sat down and decided that, well, if no one else is doing this, we have a responsibility to give it a try at least. And that was the point where I decided that I wasn't gonna continue with academia. We were going to develop the technology with a view of exploiting it with a company. When I first met Dan, he was pitching his technology, his breakthrough here in the faculty. And he's standing there as a young PhD student with an invention alongside a senior academic who has got years and years and years in this space. Uh, an abundance of, of world-renowned recognition in this space. And yet, Dan stands there with the confidence and the conviction to really drive forward what he's working on with Robert. A lot of my PhD students have worked with on industrial problems. So why didn't any of them go down the commercial route? You need a student who really wants to pick up that challenge and go beyond the research laboratory, go into the scary commercial world where, you know, you got to literally fight your way initially to be heard. And I think that is where Dan is kind of unique, I think. So he was like any other PhD student in my lab and he would have made, he had many offers to go work for industry and he knew how challenging this route on embarking on a spin-out was going to be and he knew that in two years time this could all come crashing down. So you can start with a simple idea and at a high level it, it inherently makes sense and for Dan it, it's obvious you, you can share that idea everyone gets why that could be amazing but then the detail comes who's going to buy it how much are they going to pay and how am I going to make that possible? How will I operationalize this idea? I have trained at this point for nearly seven years as a chemist. At no point in my education have I ever learned how to make a business. Any startup is risky, but when you're coupling that business risk with a significant scientific and technical risk as well, that is a very risky venture. During Dan's PhD, he was making gram quantities of the catalyst and now we have to make kilogram quantities of the catalyst. How does that work? How do you move quantities like that? How do we bring this to market? Really broad questions like that. How are we gonna fund this? As a spin-out company, we have to also draw in 
uh, early adopter projects, and that is very important. Who is actually going to run the company? Who's going to work on the technology? Who do we approach in industry to get them interested in it? Without the people that we've brought into the team, I don't think we'd have spun yet. I think we'd still be trying to put together the business model. So Ray came into the fold as an investor and has been instrumental in trying to develop us as a company. He came across as exceptional um, because not only did he know his subject matter uh, extremely well, which you always expect, I work with the venture capital world out here in Silicon Valley a lot, and, and I've learned that they don't invest in ideas, they invest in people. Um, of course, the idea has to be there, and there has to be a certain degree of soundness uh, to that idea, um, but then it's all about the team of people who are going to make it happen. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the principal is obviously the CEO. Will was one of the judges in our emerging tech competition. He asked me some very probing questions during the competition and Will has come on board as our chairman. I mean, the fact that he came to me after that Dragon's Den, he reached out to me to ask me if I would help because he'd recognised I'd asked some questions which were quite relevant to the industries he was targeting. And that was, that was pretty sharp. So without all of these individual people, I. I don't think we'd be where we are. The journey has been very much like a roller coaster. It has its amazing ups. So we're winning the competitions, getting to chat to the chief exec of a big company you've been trying to hunt down on LinkedIn, to the lows where someone turns around and tells you that your technology isn't suitable for them. The beauty of the technology is the scope of product that we can make. We've designed a technology which can actually make loads of different products from CO2. So we're able to make the foams that go into your car seats. We can make the materials that go into your shoes. We make the things that go into furniture. Um, we can even make the electrolytes that go into batteries. So I think there's a huge opportunity for Viridi CO2 as it grows its portfolio in the, in the coming months and years. So I think it's a really exciting future. The prospects for Dan are huge in this area. So he is working on a very important theme of decarbonisation, the net zero targets. They're quite steep, the targets. So we already have targets for 2030. So we have to be realistic. I think we've made a good start. And we are aware of the challenges. Everybody hits the barriers every so often. You think, oh, maybe I can't do this, maybe. But you need to have some support to, to get over the next hurdle. And there will always be hurdles. The reality is the majority of startups, particularly in high risk technical fields, the majority hit some kind of insurmountable hurdle. For whatever reason, they hit some kind of problem. And yet, Dan has brought around him investors that understand the risks and they are buying into the potential that someone like Dan, with the technology and all of the potential that has, can go on and do incredible things. And when it works, well, that's amazing. In 10 years time, I want to see Viridi CO2 having a pivotal role in ensuring that we get towards net zero emission targets. And that's not just in the UK, that's globally. I want to see a distinct transition from industry to make sure CO2 emissions and getting to net zero, or even better, net negative, is the primary goal.